again, ha a, an amazing person. Roger does not lead from behind. He tells you what you have to do. And uh, it, it, he's direct and he it, it is, he's so kind about the way he does it, but he really sees the overall flow of this and he keeps the machine, the whole machine going. And his frank and um, honest feedback really, I think, increases the quality of this program. Well, thank you everyone for the kind words and, and you're going to hear a word over and over again today and that's going to be the teamwork and that's and that's really a big emphasis and I'd like to emphasize that uh, from the surgeon aspect. Other people are going to go into the logistics of this. So, you know, surgical, out cramp, uh, surgical outreach camps, you know, have a lot of reasons that you, that you want to do them and it's an amazingly gratifying and, and productive experience, but you got to do it correctly. There's nothing more disappointing than showing up a long way away from home with the best intentions and you don't end up being able to do what you want to do. So there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of things that all happen to have, happen, have to happen correctly before um, that's going to work. If it's your first time or you're new at it, I, I strongly encourage you to sort of do some homework at home and I also strongly encourage people to travel with an experienced surgeon or group initially. And uh, Moran does that, uh, C International, there's a lot of groups that can do that. But you're going to find there's a thousand things you didn't think of on your first trip that if, you're, if you uh, don't think of them, you're going to uh, not get done what you want. I encourage people at the very start, though, to answer some few basic questions, and that is why, why are you doing this? And there's a lot of potential answers. You know, you're going to do some good uh, with your philanthropy, your direct work. Hopefully, you're going to do some teaching because that's ultimately what needs to be done. But understand, too, that this is an entirely different world than what you're used to. And you can be the king of your environment at home, and you're going to learn some new things, and you're going to get humbled along the way. So it takes more than one trip uh, of this nature before you're going to be either proficient or efficient. And, and part of that is, is establishing local relationships. Turns out you're going to get a whole lot more done and I'll have a whole lot better outcome if you uh, partner with people on the ground, whether it's a, a Lions Club or a local surgeon. Um, and the last thing I encourage you is what are you leaving behind when you leave? And that's not just the obvious things. You don't want to leave post-op complications. You don't want to leave behind any messes. But you also want to leave behind the uh, feeling and the flavor that uh, this was a positive thing and that they're going to want you to come back and continue working on, on the project. And, uh, you know, the, the characteristics I would stress for physicians that want to do this is, you know, certainly have a positive motivation about why you're doing this. Um, and to me, that means the aspects of this that don't directly relate to you. It's always a feather in your cap and it's always a feel-good thing to do this, but you've got to have a broader sense of motivations in that. The team orientedness we can't uh, stress too much and you know you don't want to go on one of these trips and stand there with your hands in the air waiting to be gloved and the only thing you're going to do is surgery while you're there. That's not going to work out as well. The more skill, the, the more diverse your skill set is, um, the better off you are. So we go and do a lot of cataracts, but in a lot of these tropical places, there's pterygia that need to be removed. There's other things, um, but you also need to be aware of your limitations. And like I said, you can be a great, you know, North American cataract surgeon, but you're going to get schooled and humbled with the level of the pathology you're going to see, and you don't want to get yourself into bad situations with bad outcomes. There are going to be a ton of things that are going to stress you. And it's not just the difficult cases and the fact that you're working with a microscope you're not familiar with and instruments you're not familiar with, but you didn't sleep on the flight over, your diet is radically different, you don't get the exercise you usually get. You're under a lot of stresses and it's really important that you maintain that calm temperament. You're going to be the leader of the team and you're going to set the tone. Do those small things that increase efficiency and that can be everything from picking the lens for the next case on the next table to running for blades when your scrub techs are out, but just the littlest of things, you know, positioning patients, gowning and gloving yourself, things we don't think about a lot in, in our world that can help to make the whole team more efi efficient. Come in with an open agenda. Don't think the only thing you're going to do is surgery because there's going to be other things you need. And be humble about all this, both in terms of the fact that you're going to have your difficulties, but you also don't want to come across to the people you're working with as, you know, we're the, the best thing that ever dropped in on you. You want to, you want to have a cultural awareness too. Um, when it comes to the logistics, uh, some of the be uh, more intelligent folks on the panel are going to talk about the specifics, but a big part of what's going to go on depends on the pre-work you do. If you show up and no one has done any uh, screening or planning, you're going to waste a bunch of your time on the front end getting going. So if you can work with a local partner, a sponsoring group, so that before you even arrive, you have some sense as to how many surgeries you're planning on doing, the types of surgeries planned, That'll guide you in terms of your planning, how much equipment do I need, how many lenses do I need to bring, that sort of thing. In terms of what screening gets done before you arrive, 
try to have an understanding of that because there quite often will be more work to be done once you arrive. So depending on who did that screening, you may want another screening done to look at the patients that were selected to make sure they're appropriate. Uh, and that can be anything from an entirely full exam. Uh, we now travel with our own biometry setup, so figure that you're going to have to do all your own biometry along the way. It's not as likely that they'll have done that for you. There's going to be a lot of cases with opaque media, so you're going to need to be able to do B scans. And you need the appropriate training, either you or somebody on your staff, to be able to do that. You want to know what you, when you, before you arrive, what kind of physical space are you going to have, and that's both clinic and OR space. So you have to know some sense of how many beds can we set up, what's that flow going to be like. Alan talked about the, the two tables set up to minimize turnover time. Um, how are you going to sterilize things, and how are you going to move people? And that's the clinic size as well. The clinic's got a lot of work to do out front, when, even when you're back in the OR. And then from all of that background research and information, that, that's what lets you make an appropriate packing list. Understand there's no way to get to your local rep or your local Walmart to get something you need. So if you don't show up with it, I figure you're not going to have it and you don't want to be dead in the water. I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. It's got a lot of stuff. But it's just a, an example of a lot of the things you got to think of that, again, in our world, my world, I don't have to think about most of this. This all happens for you behind the scenes in your ASC or in your hospital, but it's not going to be that way when you get there. So different kinds of equipment that you're going to travel with and you have to answer questions about, both in the OR and the clinic. It's always the devil's in the details. Here's a partial list. Uh, I'll point out one thing, you know, it took a couple of go-rounds to figure out you should travel with an endophthalmitis kit. It's a tackle box that's got everything you need and printed instructions on the dilution so when it happens you're not scrambling and trying to figure out how you're going to handle this. And we now travel with two of them and we leave one behind so that in case an infection were to show up three days after we leave, your host physician has got the, the equipment and the tools to treat it. Make sure you got all your drops and all your supplies. So we've come to understand, too, that if you want this to be efficient and accurate, your paperwork matters, and none of us enjoy doing paperwork. But you need to have a process. So understand, if on some of our trips we do over 200 surgeries, well, you're going to have screened more patients than that because some of them won't be appropriate for surgery. And coming with each of these patients is going to be one to three family members. So you're going to have basically a zoo out in your clinic, and it has to stay well organized so you don't make mistakes. You don't want to operate on the wrong patient, the wrong eye, or put in the wrong lens. So we've developed forms that make this easy that include not only the pre-op information but up to two post-op visits all on a single sheet. And that uh, is not only we take the information back for demographics, but we make sure a copy stays with the local providers. So if there was any problem with the surgery, there's some notes about it and they know what to expect. Um, and you don't want to, again, just leave these people hanging and leave them all these cases and they don't know anything about it. You know, you want to go to so far as to make sure the patients understand what's about to happen and there are language barriers, but you want to get some level of consent from these people. It should be done in the right way. And then in the long run, a lot of the places you're going to go to don't have all, there's not even basic demographic information about these places. So if you can collect some of that data, you can start to develop um, numbers in terms of what's the scope of the problem, what's the level of blindness in the region, and that can ultimately feed into better knowledge base. Once you get on the ground, it, it, the organization of this is quite important. I tend to be watching the OR side, but your clinic side is also incredibly important, and that's the registration and consent. You have to be able to label these people to know which eyes were screened, so we tend to use wristbands, and one wristband on a wrist means that eye's been screened and has been felt to be appropriate for surgery. You can have one on each hand if it's going to be both eyes. It's critical that you, it, on your first trip and on every trip, you don't really want to have very many patients who didn't get helped, and that's for the obvious reasons. And a huge part of that success goes to your pre-op screening. So you need to make sure, to the best of your ability, if you're going to operate on this patient, that they've got a high chance of getting their vision back. So you've got to rule out corneal problems. You've got to rule out, to the best of your ability, retinal problems, glaucoma. And you're often doing this through an opaque media. So you're not, it's not like you can look at that nerve. So you've got to develop strategies to really improve your uh, success rate. So you get as close to 100% um, good outcomes as you can. And then uh, talking to the patients so they know what to expect, uh, get them prepped. And then on the next day, you're going to have 30 to 50 people sitting in this clinic with patches on, and you've got a short period of time to get that all done. So you've got to get um, uh, those patients in, and they have to be educated about the post-op process and get their drops right, and so having that all organized. And then if you do have any uh, follow-ups that are needed, you need to make sure you've got some arrangements for that, either the local physician or somebody that's going to be able to look at cases that didn't necessarily go perfectly. And this is, just a, this is that Guatemala OR, and this is what we arrived to. There's this one room with a pillar in the middle of it, 
And we're going to end up having three surgical tables in there with two surgeons working. And then out in the hallway, we set up a pterygium uh, table. So you're working in tight spaces. You're bringing most of your own equipment, and you've got to make that um, you know, uh, go functionally well. Um, the OR flow, um, again, very important. So if you stop and think about it, if you're trying to do 40 cases a day, if you take three extra minutes per case for something, that's 120 minutes. That's two hours. So either you're there till two hours later to get those cases done or you're doing fewer cases. So you can do the math, but the efficiency matters. And that's why you want your team already well-versed in what's going to happen and who's doing what. And that way you can move the patients. And we just kind of work with the golden rule being that if the surgeons are always busy, then we're going to do the maximum amount of work we can. So it's not that we're the most important people there. That's not the point. But the point is, is we all focus on the fact that the surgeons shouldn't be sitting idle. That's wasted time, and that's another case that could be done. So we kind of... Uh, filter all of this through that concept that the surgeons need to be working. And, you know, here, for example, is an example of the block setup, and down that hallway is where the ORs are. So a patient will come to the bottom of the screen and sit in the chair first. They get moved onto the table to get blocked. And then if you can see, they go through that hallway, and there's four or five chairs sitting there. So once they've been blocked, they're there. So there's always a supply of blocked patients waiting uh, to be operated on, and that's not your bottleneck. A um, couple of, you know, points. You can't always predict the flow. As much as you like to think all of your cases are going to take 20 minutes, that's not always the case. So simple things like make sure when you block people, use a long-acting agent because they might end up sitting there for two hours and you don't want to have to re-block them. Just moving patients, as we talked about, takes time. Consider the two tables per surgeon to limit the time. Um, you know, make sure you've got enough instruments available. Either it's extra sets or sterilize them on the table with spirits, but you don't want any of those things slowing you down. The thing that slows you down the most in the OR is not how fast it is to take the cataract out, it's the complicated cases. So an uncomplicated case is 15 minutes, but you break capsule or get a zonular problem, and that can suddenly turn into an hour. And that's what's going to end up limiting you. So it's not about speed, it's about efficiency. So don't go so fast that you get complications, because that's going to um, slow you down. We don't even shut down the OR for lunch. So people come in with a straw and some stuff. The only guy I've ever met who can sit eight hours without moving is this guy. And he literally doesn't stand up. He just sits there and he operates. But we bring him stuff and feed him under his mask, et cetera. And uh, we always have the ethic that, you know, we don't want to leave anyone sitting in the queue at the end of the day. So if we're working until 9 o'clock at night, yeah, you know, yeah, you're hungry. But there's two more blind people out there. So. And uh, here's an example you already saw in the video of the two-table setup, so I won't go over that again. Post-op clinic, that's how you're going to start your days. Uh, patches come off. Uh, the, the staff will go down, take patches off, clean their lid off, get a quick check of vision, which is really count fingers or I can see you because you're, you're really just looking for bad complications. And we run, run down the line with a tonal pen to make sure that there's nobody with a pressure of 50. Um, if you have a slit lamp, that's great, although we just take loops for the most part, and we can go down these rows using your uh, magnifying loops, and you can see most things you need to see. Um, you know, you're going to have to give instructions and medications to 40 people who speak a different language. So a simple thing we now have in, each, in a Ziploc bag, the post-op drops and in the local language the instructions, and so every patient can just be handed this, and then we still give them a, a little talk about that. Uh, involve the families and friends because they're the ones that are going to be uh, contributing to all this. But simple things that you can think of in advance. At the end of the day, though, you're only going to keep doing this if you enjoy the experience. So you're going to be all of these things. You're going to be tired and jet-lagged and not feeling well and your stomach's upset. But you sit through all of that, you've got to make sure that you enjoy it all because that's why you're going and you won't keep going if you don't enjoy it. Um, and it's the most profound thing to share something like this with people is give them back their sight. I mean, every morning the patches come off and everybody in the clinic, patients and providers alike, we all have a good cry and then we go to the OR and we start all over again. And this is my favorite picture of a surgeon who multitasks. So don't be shy about doing anything you're asked to do. Uh, you know, when you, these uh, patients are not in good shape and they can't walk fast, you know, Jeff's a big, strong guy, and uh, off you go. And so it's just my quintessential picture of how it is that you need to come to these with the right expectations, and that is do what needs to be done. If you come standing on ceremony, you're going to slow things down. But anyway, I feel so privileged to be part of this. I'll keep doing it, as Susan said, as long as I can. Thank you.